Hey everyone, I will go and record chapter 18 end of chapter questions. The first question is economic rent or pure rent. This one is defined as the price paid for the use of land and other non-reproducible resources. Question number two, which of the following statements is correct? This will be number D, economic rent is the price paid for productive land resources whose, whose supply is perfectly inelastic. Perfectly inelastic means the supply curve is a vertical straight line. Now question three, economic rent refers to price paid for land and other natural resources that are fixed in total supply now moving on to question number four as you can see here we have three different demand curves and one single supply curve and higher and higher demand curves means higher demand for land and consequently higher land rent Question four, they're asking if demand is D2, a tax of X per acre will do what? This is not going to affect the quantity of land available to society. Okay. Now, question number five. So here we have three different graphs. And the supply of land is inelastic or in perfectly fixed supply in each of these three graphs, A, B, and C. Let's see what are they asking here. We have three different demand curves, each at different levels. Uh, on the basis of these figures, we can say this one is most productive because the demand is at its highest and it would be the highest. So this is D. Now question number six, we have the same three graphs here. So on the basis of these three figures, we can say that the land shown in figure A is the only free good. So basically there is no demand for this land and this is available to use for everyone and no one really wants to use it. Question seven, the economist who advocated a single tax on land. This was Henry George. Question eight, which of the following illustrates the time value of money concept? This is going to be B, where Bob is willing to sacrifice $100 today in order to receive $110 next month. Now, question number nine, here we have the demand for loanable funds and the supply of loanable funds. This is a two quadrant graph on the horizontal axis. We have the quantity of loanable funds and on the vertical axis, we have the interest rate. Wherever the demand curve for loanable funds intersect the supply curve for loanable funds, we have the equilibrium interest rate. So the supply, this comes from the savers or the sellers and the demand for loanable funds this comes from the borrowers or from the buyers now coming to this question here where it says the supply of loanable funds is s1 and demand is D1, 
the equilibrium interest rate and the quantity bought is how much we have to look at the intersection of s1 and d1 this occurs at this point where the interest rate is f and the quantity of loanable funds this will be equal to this is going to be equal to a this is the answer question 10 the demand for loanable funds is not sloping this is like a demand curve here because businesses find that more investments are profitable at lower interest rate than at higher interest rates remember the demand curve where we had the price quantity combination over here the quantity is the quantity of loanable funds and the vertical axis we have the interest rate when interest rates are higher businesses will borrow less loanable funds when business when interest rate is lower they are going to borrow more loanable funds they find it more profitable that's the concept the same relation we have between price and quantity for a commodity also holds for loanable funds here loanable, loanable funds is a commodity going to question 11 other things staying the same an increase in productivity of capital uh this is going to increase the demand for loanable funds and the equilibrium interest rate let me show you how this is my quantity this is my interest rate this one is my initial demand curve now this one is my supply curve when the productivity of capital increases definitely the demand curve is kind of shaped to the right all right for the initial point let the interest rate be equal to six percent quantity demanded is equal to 100 now the demand curve has shifted to the right from d1 d0 to d1 supply curve st staying the same this is can you increase the price or the interest rate for loanable funds and also increase the quantity of loanable funds okay that was 11 now we can go to question number 12. we have a bad bit of a math here we have the beginning val value ending value and interest so refer to the table representing Kara's bank account if two thousand dollar was deposited into her account at the beginning of year one and no further deposits or withdrawals were made the value for sale b is how much total interest in year one this will be the ending period value from that we subtract the beginning period value and this one is gonna be equal to 200 that is for sale a it's gonna write it down here but the question they're asking is for sale sale b there are actually two ways of doing it okay uh we can either see sell b this is the ending period value in year two whatever was the ending period value in year one i'm just gonna i was writing it as period one i'm just gonna say this is year one this becomes the beginning period value in year two now if i add 
the beginning period value with the total interest rate which is equal to let's see here so if i add this i get the value as 2620 and is this the answer to your question no that's not the answer to question number 12. i need to find out what is my interest in period two i i can do it in this way i take the beginning period value here i multiply by the interest rate now what is my interest rate here that's another good question interest rate is the same for all three periods here so it's not changing i'm going to find the interest rate from period one this is equal to 200 over the beginning period value so the formula is total interest in period one over the beginning period value i multiply times 100 so this one is equal to 10 percent okay now as i was telling you there are two ways of finding the value b here this 2200 i can multiply times let's just use another color here so i can multiply this times one point one plus 0 0.10 so this becomes 2200 times 1.10 if we do the multiplication this will be 2420 okay so this is how we find the ending period value in period two there is another interesting way easier way of finding this value which is b i know the beginning value in period beginning value in period one and the ending value in period two now what i'm going to do is i want to find the future value in period two I'm going to use the formula here the present value times one plus interest rate square so i'm going to square it because there are two periods period one and period two and i just tried to find out the value in period two so if you do the math 2000 times one plus 0 0.10 square you can also get this value 2420 so you can do it either way whichever you find easier with this type of problems you can either take the beginning value in year two multiply times one plus interest rate find the ending value in year two or take the beginning value at the at the beginning of year one multiply it times one plus interest rate square and find the ending value in period two okay just practice practice makes everything easier oh question number 13 i'm pretty much sure you can do this by yourself right now total interest ending period value minus beginning period value and you have this number as two hundred dollars okay All right so question number this is question number 13 answer to this one is two hundred dollars now question number 14 on january 1 alex deposited 5,000 into a savings account that pays 5% interest rate compounded annually. 
This makes it so much easier when it is compounded annually. If it is compounded semi-annually or quarterly, the interest rate calculation becomes more complicated. All right, he is not making any deposits or withdrawals. How much will Alex have in his account five, three years from now? Here I'm going to use the future value formula. Future value in year three is equal to present value times one plus interest rate, which is 5%. That means 0 0.05. Three years is going to be power root of three. I can do the math here and my result for question number 14 will be equal to 5788. So ignore the uh, numbers after the decimal sign here is going to be 5788.125. Just report it as 5788. Okay. Going to question 15. Suppose the interest payments are $140 per year on a $1,000 loan and $1188 per year on an $8485 loan. The interest rate on the two loans. First one will be $140 over $1,000 times $100. That's 14%. The second one will be 1188 over 8485 times 100. That's approximately 14%. So question number 15. This one is 14% on both loans. All right, question 16. There are also two ways for finding out the value here. So this was what I found out too. I'm just writing down what I found out so far from other problems. Now, you can either find the value of d here 2 for 20 times let's see what was do you remember what was the interest rate my interest rate was equal to 1.10 uh, i can just let me see do this thing i'm just trying to find out two ways of Finding E. Okay, first method. I take 2420. I'm going to go ahead. Oh, let me see. This one's question 16. I'm going to multiply this times 1.10. If I do that, my value will be 2662. This is one way of finding this problem. See the interest rate always total interest over this one times say 100, 10%. Now there is another way of finding out E. And the second method for finding out E is I am going to take the beginning period value, which is 2000, multiply times 1 plus 0 0.10, that means 1 plus interest rate, qubit, because I'm trying to find it for 3 years. So this is going to be 2662. Okay. All right, so this value is 2662. I did not find the value for cell D yet. So that's basically 
the next question question 17 so this becomes a little bit complicated because what i want to do here is here asking us to find out the total interest rate so this value d is the total interest rate from period one two and three i can add up the interest rate in each individual period and get the total interest rate so here i am going to create another column which says interest rate in each period and find out the value period one the interest rate is 2000 times 0 0.10 this is 200 that's what i can just and because this is period one so we do not have any interest in period zero so basically this is a total interest rate in period one and also basically the interest rate from period zero to period one now let's go to period two here where the value was 2200 now i'm going to multiply this times 0 0.10 so 2200 times 0 0.10 the value i'm getting is 220 so notice here 200 plus 220 that's 420 that's the total interest rate in period uh one and period two now the value of c from the previous table is 2420 so i take 2420 and multiply this times 0.10 so 2420 times 0 0.10 this value will be equal to 242 now if i add all these values together what i have here is 662 and that will be d which is 662 and this cell d is the addition of year one two and three interest rate do not get confused here because this was the total interest rate and this is the interest rate in each period okay going to question 18 demand for land is downward sloping however the supply of land is vertical or perfectly inelastic perfectly inelastic this is going to be the supply of land question 19 present value refers to value today of a specific amount of money to be received in the future present value is future value over one plus interest rate of to the power number of years question number 20 other things remaining equal interest rates are lower on less risky loans than on riskier loans question number 21 xyz corporation determines it can make a real inflation adjusted return on an investment of nine percent so my rate of return is 9%. The nominal interest rate is 13% and the inflation is 7%. Is this investment worth taking? Let's find out the real interest rate. Real interest rate is nominal interest rate from that we take off inflation. This is equal to 6%. And my rate of investment is equal to 9% because 9% is greater than 
investment will be profitable. Rate of return is greater than interest rate. So we are going to go ahead and undertake this investment. Okay. Now take a look at question number 22. Refer to the graph above table above in Darcy's bank account if she deposited $1,000 in her account at the beginning of year one and made no further deposits or withdrawals straight would she receive in year two only okay so I want to find out the interest rate here first so the interest rate here is going to be equal to 60 over a thousand times 100. So my interest rate here is 6%. I have my ending period value in period one as the beginning period value in period two. I want to find the interest rate in period two only. This will be thousands times 0 0.60. This one's equal to 63.6. Remember, this is the interest rate in period two only. Okay. That's how you do it. Now, question number 23, the real interest rate, how to find out the real interest rate by subtracting inflation from the nominal interest rate. Question 24, this question looks similar to me. The real interest rate is the interest rate after adjustment has been made for inflation. Question 25, the pure rate of interest rate is approximated by the rate paid on long-term government bonds. Now, question number 26, other things remaining equal, an increase in equilibrium interest rate will decrease purchase of capital goods and reduce R&D spending because when interest rates increases, the borrowers will borrow less. Like this is the demand curve for loanable funds. Interest rate is 4%. I have interest rate on the horizontal axis, quantity of loans on the uh, interest rate on the vertical axis, quantity of loans on the horizontal axis. Say this is equal to 100. So interest rate is increasing from 4% all the way to 6%. Quantity of loans, quantity of borrowing goes down as interest rate goes up and R&D spending also goes down as a result of that. All right, question number 27. This is a repeat question. I would ask you to do this yourself right now. I think you can do it. The interest rate is 10%. Question number 28. The marginal revenue product of land declines as more land is bought into production because of diminishing returns. Question number 29 referred to the table. Looks like we have some fixed quantities supplied, so that's right. And we have to look at columns to two through five and the relevant columns are one two and three okay so i have the quantity supplied here this is fixed at 60 the land rent is given on the horizontal on the vertical axis here we have the land rent horizontal axis we have the quantity of land I have the demand curve intersecting the supply curve and I'm supposed to look at 
one, two, and three. Like I have to look at this demand schedule and this supply schedule. So it matches up here. The land rent is gonna be 200 per acre. I get this where the demand curve intersects the supply curve. Now the last question, the demand for farmland will increase if technological advances makes it more productive. See, the demand curve for land is the marginal revenue product for land. This one is equal to the marginal productivity of land times the price of the good that is produced on the land. If any of this increases, the demand for land will also go up. All right, this brings us to the end of the questions for this chapter. Thank you very much.